I officially know that I'm getting old because I have no clue when new social media apps come out. Anybody with me in the house tonight? Like I'm just, it's not on my radar. I don't know, but you, you don't need to really worry about me, okay? You don't need to worry about me because if you need to know anything about the newest season of Paw Patrol, then I am your guy, okay? Um, so in January or, or, or in December of this last year, Forbes magazine dubbed Be Real the social media app of the year. And if you're not familiar with how it works, this is the way that it works is every day at a different time, everyone gets a notification simultaneously to post a picture, a real picture of themselves. And they've only got two minutes to do it. And so they've got to post it and then upload it. And the whole idea is that being real, this app shows who your friends really are in their real life. Now, it is no secret that we live in the most filtered, photoshopped, fake version of the world that has ever existed, right? Everybody's life looks glossy and perfect. But to be real, haha, I think that we, remember, Paw Patrol, dad jokes. I think that we're growing bored with perfect because we all know that perfect isn't real, amen? Like, I don't know about you, but I can't keep up, I can't, attain or maintain this photoshopped version of life. Like I can't keep up with the Instagram version of travel and I can't keep up with all of the Facebook friends and I can't put together a Pinterest five-star perfect dinner every Tuesday night. Like, I'm sorry, Lexi, but I can't make your charcuterie boards, okay? <laughs> and this is what I found is that for even those few people who are able to catch this photoshopped, filtered version of life, it doesn't take long for them to realize that it doesn't really live up to the hype, that it doesn't actually deliver what they want it to deliver. And so we thought, what if we could pull back the layers and we could expose the fraud of the filtered life? Because I believe that there is this deep relational longing in all of us for something that's authentic and something that's genuine and something that's real, something that lasts, something that delivers more than the superficial version of relationships that we are sold each and every day. And so throughout this series, we want to expose the fraud of the filtered life and lead you into real relationships because fake ones are exhausting. I want to contend for your soul that there is more out there than what has been sold to you by social media or by marketers or by this culture. That there is a real depth of relationship that you were made for and that you were created for and that life will never be whole without. You know, I saw this trend recently that helps expose the fraud of the filtered life, and I just absolutely loved it. And so I wanted to show it to you today. Check this out. This is Instagram versus reality. Watch this. My life be like, wow. yeah. Ooh. Ah. Ooh. Ah. Ooh. <laughs> Uh, social media ain't always what it seems to be. Can I get an amen? And uh, so what if we could explore what real relationships look like? That's what we're gonna do throughout this series. And tonight we're gonna start with real love. Let me hear you say real love. And so let's ask that question, like what is love? What is real love? What is true love? Like how do you find the one? And is there really just one? And do you really just know when you know? And how do you stay in love? 
And what happens if you feel like you're falling out of love? What happens if the spark doesn't spark anymore? What happens if love runs dry? And is it really better to have loved and lost than to have never loved at all? What is real love? Romans chapter 12 says this. It says, let love be genuine. Let love be genuine. The Bible says that there is a real love and that there's a fake love. There's a genuine love, an authentic love, and then there is a counterfeit love, a phony love. How many of you, by show of hands, want to experience true love tonight? Okay, listen, if your hands aren't up, you need counseling, okay? Like everybody wants to experience true love. Like the truth is, is that we've just become so jaded and cynical that we don't even know if it's possible anymore. Or, or maybe it's just that we don't even know what it really is. Maybe the problem is that we don't know what real love, what true love actually is. You see, we live in this world full of unrealistic expectations, full of social media highlight reels and online dating profiles and reality TV shows. And so how are we supposed to know what real love, what true love actually is? Like, is Bridgerton real love? Is that real love? Is Emily in Paris real love? Is what Justin and Haley have real love? Is what Kim and Kanye have, I mean, had? Was that real love? <laughs> Is what Tom and Giselle have, oh, had, too soon, too soon. What about Blake Lively and Ryan Reynolds? That's gotta be true love, right? Like we're holding out for you, Reynolds family. It all counts on you. <laughs> Is that real love? Is that true love? Is whoever Taylor Swift is gonna break up with next week, is that real love? Is that what true love really is? Is love really blind? Can love really be found on Love Island? Or The Bachelor? Or The Bachelorette? Or The Bachelorette on an island in paradise? Is that real love? Is real love making out with 22 people but just giving roses to 11 of them? Is that real love? I mean, we've got all of these messages, all of these pictures of love that are coming out at us from so many different directions that we've got to ask, like, what actually is love? You know, what I've noticed is that in this day and age, we are in love with love. We are so in love with love and culture sees it. And so they're selling us their counterfeit version of it. And we're buying we're buying left and right, saying yes to a temporary, fractured, broken image of love that is far removed from God's design of it as we see in his word. The love that we are sold is portrayed as something that is irresistible attraction. The love that we're sold is wild and sexual and emotional. I read this this week, and I just thought it perfectly captured culture's vision of love says that the love that we're sold today is served up as a shaken up cocktail, a cocktail of elation and pain, anxiety and relief, altruism and jealousy. All of these emotions coexist in this confusion of feelings that hold you hostage and that drive your actions. You see, the love that we're sold is out of control. The love that we're sold is a version of love where Cupid shoots you with his little arrow and then you just can't help yourself. It's like, I don't get to choose who I love. I just love who I love. The heart wants what the heart wants. You grab her in her eyes and you say, this is bigger than you or me, baby, right? That's the version of love that we are sold, where we are just hijacked and our emotions are driven and our actions are driven by this love. And I just want for you to know that there's a big problem if that's actually how love works. Because what if, if that's how love works, then no marriage is safe tonight, right? Because what if Cupid tonight is trying to shoot you, but he misses and he hits me, and I just fall in love with somebody else random tonight? Kayla will fight you, all right? Like she is tiny and fun-sized, but she is ferocious, okay? And so if that's the way that love works, then no marriage is safe. There's got to be a better, a bigger, a more secure version of love than the one that we're sold every day. But the version of love that we're sold every day sounds like a dream, 
Like when you're in it, it just feels like a dream, right? It's picnics and puppies. It's great outfits and adventures. It's perfect lighting and the sun setting as you're kissing. And as you're walking to your car, it just starts to rain and birds start to chirp and Justin Bieber starts to play in the background. And it just feels perfect, right? And it's passionate and wild and free and full of morning sex, which by the way, is never interrupted by, by, by bad breath. Have you ever noticed that? Like in every version of that, like bad breath never seems to get in the way. And I'm here to tell you after 16 years of being with someone, I don't care how much you love them, girl gonna need a Tic Tac, okay? So <laughs> keep some gum on your nightstand in Jesus' name. That's my first marriage tip for you tonight. But here's the truth. So much of that is fake love. And so far removed from the real love that we see in scriptures. You see, real love is longer lasting. Real love is life giving. Real love has grit to it. Real love's got commitment in it. Real love is not driven by emotions, but it is concrete action. That's real love. You see, I'm gonna pick on you for a second. There is a particular group of people in the world they're called girls, and um, a lot of them have these lists, these lists of the perfect guy, of what love is and who their perfect mate is going to be. Have you, th these lists are crazy. Have you ever met somebody with one of these lists? All right, not a lot of laughter. I guess you have these lists, okay? These lists are crazy, y'all. Okay, like, this is the way that it goes. He must be, like, wealthy but not greedy, and he must be like tall, but not a giraffe. And he must be like in shape, but not so in shape that he makes me feel insecure about my body, okay. And he must be like, he must be strong and sensitive. He must be like mature and fun. He must be smart enough to graduate from law school, but silly enough to make a TikTok with me on Friday night. <laughs> Do you hear how crazy that sounds? You see, what we end up doing is we take the version of love that rom-com movies and that social media and that culture sells us and we make it the list that we're striving for and it puts so much pressure on people and on love that it's destined to disappoint. And tonight, I just wanna challenge you, every single one of you, whether you got a list or not, to rip it up and to make this your list instead. First Corinthians chapter 13, he is patient and he is kind. He does not envy or boast, he is not proud, he does not dishonor others, he is not self-seeking, he is not easily angered. He keeps no record of wrongs. He does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. He always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. And he understands that love never ends. Can you make that your list instead? I'm here to tell you tonight that you would suffer a whole lot less heartbreak if that's the kind of person that you were looking for rather than whatever else you've put on your list. So, Wait a second, Joey, are you, are you telling me that I could just like marry somebody who meets those qualifications like nothing else matters? Look right at me. Yes, I sure am. And I'm not telling you that it doesn't matter that he's a little cute or that she's a little attractive, okay? You're gonna need that because it's going to be hard, difficult work to be in love with someone. And there are gonna be times where you're like, I don't like them, but at least they're cute, okay? So cute matters. It just doesn't matter as much as you think that it does. Do you know what matters? Their character, their person, who they actually are. Guy and girl, single or married, dating or engaged, it doesn't matter. One of the best things that you could do for your life tonight is hit eject on the Disneyland fairy tale that you were sold and start to pursue this version of love for your life instead. Because it is better, it is stronger, it is beautiful. And it is going to actually deliver what your soul and what your heart actually wants. I want for you to know, that real love knows that your soulmate, that looking for the unicorn, the mythical one, is a lie from Greek mythology, okay? 
That comes from Plato's, uh, Plato's ideology where he told this whole narrative that we were these fractured people and that you've got to find your other half. And we are still believing that lie that Plato sold us thousands of years ago. There is no perfect person for you. Do you know how I know? There ain't no perfect people. Not a single one of them. We are all broken, all fractured, all sinful. And and let's just act like there was a perfect person for you. If there was, you're just gonna mess them up, okay? And so one of the great things you could do, just let go of that rom-com myth that there's this mythical one for you that you must find out there in the universe and then everything's gonna come together and complete you. Jerry Maguire lied, okay? Great spouses make terrible saviors. There is no one who can complete you other than Jesus. So let that go. And let me just tell you, and this will be like something that I try to say throughout the series. We put so much pressure on love. Like, like the, the unrealistic expectations that we have for people today, I believe, is one of the reasons that marriage is happening later and later now. Because we've, we've so idealized and so fantasized this version of marriage that nobody can actually live up to. And it's not about them being the perfect person. It's actually about you growing into a new person together. That's what a relationship is actually about. And so it becomes less about finding the one and more about focusing on being the one, on having the kind of character that can actually build a life with someone else. Don't settle for the fake version of love that we are sold every single day. Now, I know what some of you guys are asking. You're like, Joey, why are we even talking about this? I thought we were supposed to be talking about Jesus and now you got me all stressed out. Why are we talking about like love and romance? And let me tell you why. The reason that we're talking about this is because there's almost nothing that contributes to the state of one's soul like relationships, like our happiness, our sense of well-being, our like our sure-footedness in the world. So much of that is connected to our relationships and not just romantic ones, friendships and family, but, but relationships are so unbelievably important. The quality of our life depends on the quality of our relationships. You need to write that down. The quality of your life depends on the quality of your relationships. What you're doing with your life doesn't, as, doesn't matter as much as who you're doing it with. You could have the world at your fingertips. You could have your dream job and your dream house and your dream car and be on your dream yacht in the middle of who knows where, sad because you ain't got nobody there with you. The quality of your life depends on the quality of your relationships. But something happens in the human psyche when we are inundated with millions of images setting false expectations for what true love is. And so tonight, I wanna talk about what real love is, what it actually is. And let me just say this on the front end of this, is romantic love should not be the primary pursuit of your life. Somebody needs to write that down tonight. Romantic love should not be the primary pursuit of your life. God's biggest dream for you is not for you to get married. That is not his biggest dream for your life. I want for you to know that John the Baptist wasn't married, the apostle Paul who wrote most of the New Testament wasn't married, and guess what? Your savior, Jesus, never got married. Never got married. God has a bigger vision for your life than marriage. Paul writes about this in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 7. He says, I wish that all were as myself, but each has his own gift from God, one of one kind and one of another. To the unmarried and the widows, I say that it is good for them to remain single as I am. According to the apostle Paul, being single is a gift. It's a gift. Now, I know what some of you guys are thinking. You're like, well, Is there like a gift receipt? Like, can I return this gift and exchange it for a different one? Like, because I don't like this gift. But singleness is a gift, the apostle Paul says. And let me show you why it's a gift. Skip down to uh, verse 35. I say this for your own benefit, not to lay any restraint upon you, but to promote good order and to secure your undivided devotion for the Lord. Did you catch that? Being married is not our purpose. Our purpose is to live with undivided devotion to Jesus. You need to write that down. You need to just 
burn that in your eyes this year. Making a lot of money, not the purpose of my life. Finding the one for me, not the, person of my, not the purpose of my life. Having kids, not the purpose of my life. Ton of friends, not the purpose of my life. Living with undivided devotion to Jesus, that's the purpose of my life. And it could it be, could it be? The reason that God hasn't brought that person into your life is because if he did, you would live with undivided devotion to them and not him. Could it be that the great gift that he is giving you is your singleness so that you can actually learn the truth that he is what you need and he is who can provide everything that your heart is so deeply longing for? Singleness is a gift until you learn that lesson. And then once you learn that lesson, if you learn that lesson, maybe God will have you right there for your whole life in joy and doing ministry because devotion to Jesus, that's all that you need and that's all that you're gonna do. But, but maybe eventually you'll get to a place where being with someone will create more devotion to Jesus than being without someone. But that's between you and the Lord and the Holy Spirit and the call that he's placed on your life. And for each of us, it's different, but we must recognize tonight, this is not the end for which we strive. Undivided devotion to Jesus, that is the goal of our life. First Corinthians 13, it's not even primarily talking about romantic love. It's read at all of these weddings and goes on you know, so many poems and it makes us feel all these emotions, but it's primarily talking about the kind of love that is supposed to be experienced from God to us and from us back towards God and that we're supposed to share in the community of faith as the church of Jesus, as followers of the new covenant. Like this is how we're supposed to act towards one another. And so, Yes, it acts as a great foundation for romantic love, but that's not its primary purpose. So don't get things mixed up tonight. Your first goal is undivided devotion to Jesus. Everything comes after that. Let's look at what it really is. We're gonna break this down section by section, verse by verse. And verse four says this, 1 Corinthians 13, four, love is patient and kind. Let me hear you say patient and kind. So what fake love does is fake love wants to look perfect. But real love is committed to the process. Fake love wants to look perfect right now. Like I got it all together right now. Like I'm shiny right now. Like it's the end of the destination right now. But, but real love is committed to the process. Real love understands that, that it's a growth thing, that it's something that happens over time. The love you want will not happen right away. It is something that like fine wine, real love gets better with age. I, I love this quote that I saw this week. It says, love at first sight is easy to understand. It's when two people have been looking at each other for a long time that it becomes a miracle. <laughs> you see, it is hard to be single. It is also hard to be married. You are simply exchanging one kind of difficulty for a different kind of difficulty. And the difficulty of marriage is going to require continued patience. Real love is a hard, patient work of two people who are kindly committed to the process. It's built and grown and worked on. Real love pushes through where fake love gives up. It's patient. It understands that we're all people with real sin and real struggles. And so real love sees the potential in people and doesn't demand instant maturity or growth. Real love goes, okay, this person who I'm loving, I get that, guess what? They're an idiot, much like me. And they're gonna stumble and they're gonna fall and they're gonna make mistakes and they're gonna disappoint me. And so I'm committed to them in the midst of the process. You will never be able to experience true love until you exude patience, until you can patiently walk with somebody, work with somebody, grow with somebody, your dream person isn't out there to be found. You create that person together. You grow into those people together. And it is a patient, diligent, slow process. You see, fake love wants to stand on the mountain and just take the picture. Real love realizes it's my job to climb the hill and to carry the baggage that they've not gotten rid of yet. Because every person is going to come into some relationships with some baggage. And real love understands, well, guess what? That's, 
part of the equation now. And so I'm caring that for them because I really love them. And I'm going to be patient with them as they work through their family of origin. And I'm going to be patient with them as they work through being a new believer. And I'm going to be patient with them as they work through the abuse in their past. And I'm going to be patient with them as they work through the way that they were formed and the way that they grew up. And I'm going to be patient with them because they didn't have a dad who was in, a picture, in the picture. And I'm going to be patient with them because they come from a broken home. And I'm going to be patient with them because they haven't quite gotten that thing worked out yet. And so I'm going to be patient with them. That's what real love looks like. It doesn't demand perfection right now. Get this together. Get your act together. Clean it up. No, no, I'm patiently working with you, loving you, because I see the potential of who you could become. Real love is patient, patiently committed to the process. And real love is kind, which, just so you know, doesn't mean nice, okay? We confuse kindness with niceness, and that's not what that means at all. This word in the Greek actually has to do with adding value to something, to be kind, to do something for someone that adds value to their life. That is what kindness is. And so kindness, love that is kind, realize that I am not a passive bystander in this equation. I'm not just sitting back and hoping that they kind of figure it out. No, I am stepping in to help and to serve and to love and to care for them and to add value to their life. Do you see? that this idea of patience and kindness, it is not emotion, but it's action. You see, fake love is driven by emotions. Real love is action that knows that emotion will eventually catch up. Because as you start to act this way towards someone, as you start to patiently walk with them, as you start to be kind to them and add value to their life and serve them and support them, those emotions that you're wanting to feel, they start to come over time. When you let emotion lead, it becomes a massive disaster. And so then Paul, he goes away from two things that love is to eight things that love is not. This is what he says, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 4. It does not envy, and it does not boast, and it is not proud. Now, I've seen way too many couples who are in competition with one another, who their entire relationship is a rivalry. Who's better Who's going to get more? Whose turn is it? And so everything is like compromise. And I'm not saying that there isn't good wisdom in compromise, but everything can't be a competition. Okay, it, it, it can't be about why do you get to go out and have fun and why do I have to stay at home with the kids and why, why, why do you get to stay at home and do nothing and watch Netflix and why do I have to go out and make money, okay? Like everything can't be this competition. I've seen so many relationships that work this way. And so... In, in my job, I, I get to do some really incredible things, some really awesome things. I get to travel the world. I get to meet really interesting people. I get to go speak at camps and retreats. And um, I get to, you know, connect relationally with people. And so a lot of times we're going out to eat. And so I, I, I've got to eat really great meals. And uh, people want to connect. And so they'll invite me over and we'll go to their lake house or we'll go skiing together or whatever. And so I've got to do all these amazing things. Guys are like, hey, let's, I need some pastoral advice advice. So let, let's go play golf together. Okay. And I'm like, if, I'll, if, if I've got to suffer for the gospel, I guess I will out there on the golf course. And it would be so easy for my wife, Kayla, to be at home with our three kids, three snotty nosed kids who are asking her for a million snacks and wiping their noses on her and peeing everywhere to be like, oh, you're going to work on the golf course and for her to feel anger and competition and go, when is it my turn? But that's not what real love does. Real love is not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It is grateful and joyful and so pumped when the other person gets something that's great. You're, you're never asking, when's it my turn? And if that's in you, I just want for you to know, you might not have discovered real love yet. Real love is so pumped when something good happens for the other person. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. Real love, I just want to say some things on this idea of not being proud and not boasting because I think that it's important. Real love can also admit when it's wrong. Real love can own its mistakes. I say this all the time. I 
teach lots of leadership things to people who want to lead and young leaders. And I, I tell them one of the greatest ways that you are going to grow is by failing. Okay, it's going to happen. One of the, the greatest way you will grow is not through succeeding. It's through failing. I've learned more through my failures than I ever have through my successes. And so when you fail, fall on your sword. Just fall on your sword. Just own your mistake. I did it. Don't blame shift. Don't point to something else. Yes, I blew it. I didn't show up. I didn't do the work. I didn't think through that. I blew it and I need grace. Real love falls on its sword. It can own its mistakes. I heard a friend say it like this once. Real love gives up the right to always be right in order to be close. Real love gives up the right to always be right in order to be close. If you want to win every argument, you're not going to stay in love very long. If you are trying to win every single argument, you're not going to stay in love very long. One of the most painful days of my marriage, I will never forget it, Kayla and I, and we'll talk about this more later, but... Man, we, we are different in so many ways, and everybody thinks that it's just like, a, a, you know, a, a rom-com to be married to me. They're like, oh, you, he just must be so funny at home, and he just must be so sweet and kind and good with his words. But what people don't understand is that there's like a back edge to that quick wit. And so those words that I can use that are engaging and funny can also be really quick and sharp and hurt. And so I'll never forget the day when we're arguing about something that she was right about. And she says to me, it doesn't matter how much we argue, you're always going to outlogic me and be right. You're going to win every argument, so why do I even try anymore? And what fake love would have done is it would have used that as this way to exercise authority for the rest of our relationship. But what real love did is it broke down and I, I was humble. I started to cry and asked for forgiveness. And I tried to, for the rest of our marriage to go, hey, let me just pause. I don't want to have logic you here. Let's, let's talk about this. Let's slow down because I don't want to be right. I want us to be close. That's what real love really looks like. Real love, it does not envy and it does not boast and it is not proud. Quick word on being proud to quote the great prophet Justin Bieber. If you like the way you look that much, baby, you should go and love yourself. Verse five, verse five. <laughs> love does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. Love does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. Some translations has this idea of does not dishonor others as is not rude. Love is not rude, meaning love has good manners. Love is courteous and polite and sensitive. Love doesn't broadcast the problems of another person. Love doesn't run others down with jokes and sarcasm. Love defends their character as much as possible within the limits of truth. Love doesn't lie about weaknesses, but it won't deliberately expose them either. Love has manners. Love is courteous and kind. It doesn't dishonor others. The reason that we aren't courteous, though, is because we are so preoccupied with ourselves. So we're just gonna get really good tonight and really important. Like this is the meat of the message tonight. Like we're gonna dig in right here. When self is the focus, love isn't the filter. You are not the primary object of love. The point of love and specifically love inside of marriage, is not to make you happy. It is not to meet your needs. It is not to make you feel fulfilled. The point of love is not to make you happy. It is to make you holy. It is to make you more like Jesus, to conform you into his image, to make your mind like his mind, to make your language like his language, to make your thoughts like his thoughts. That's the design of love. And what does he say about love? John chapter 15, verse 13, greater love has no one than this, that someone to lay down his life for his friends. Greater love has no man than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. Love isn't about get, getting, it is about giving. Love is not about receiving or taking. Love is about laying yourself down. 
I love the way that the theologian Charles Spurgeon talks about this. He says this, he says, this is so good. Selfishness is the root problem of the human race. It is the antithesis of love. Love is self-sacrificing. Cure selfishness and you plant a garden of Eden. Hear this today. The real beauty of loving someone is that love takes you into a new reality, a transcendent place where life is no longer all about you. Self is no longer the focus. Self is no longer the center. And let me tell you a little secret. That's the place where self is truly found. It's at the end of yourself that you really find yourself. You see, love liberates you from the lie that life is all about you. You think that the love that you're looking for is going to make you feel fulfilled and meet all your needs and make you happy, and that's not actually the design of love. Love gets you to see that, guess what? You're not the point. And that is the place of the greatest freedom you will ever find. You were not made to be the point Jesus is. And your spouse is used as a gift to you to let you never forget that truth. And it is when you are actually at the end of yourself that you experience the greatest joy that you could ever find. You see, this isn't, this isn't, the, this isn't the message that culture is giving you about love these days. It's all focused on you. And I'm just, I'm trying to offer you a different narrative, maybe one that will actually work and tell you if you make it about you, it's gonna cave in on you. But if you make it about the other person being committed to their good and to their growth and to the process that God has them on, then you might actually find the love that you've been looking for. Don't settle for fake love. Demand real love. I love this analogy when thinking about getting to the end of myself and using myself for the good of another person. Um, Michelangelo sculpted a David. How many of you are familiar with the sculpture David? It's one of the most famous sculptures of all time and it's said to be pristine and perfect and it's held up in art as just pristine and perfect. And Michelangelo was once asked how he was able to do it how he was able to take this chunk of marble and turn it into the beautiful image that David is. This image that has you know, stood the test of time at this point in its beauty. And I, I love his response. Michelangelo said, all I did is I looked at that rock and I saw David and I chiseled everything else away. Everything that wasn't David, I just chiseled it away. You know, that's what marriage is supposed to do. That's what love is supposed to do. It's supposed to see the potential in someone, the absolute best in someone, and say, I wanna use my life to chisel everything else away, to see them grow into the full potential of who God created them to be. Don't settle for the fake version of love. Real love is so much better. First Corinthians chapter 13, verse five. Love is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Listen, real love isn't touchy. Real love doesn't get its feelings hurt very easily. Real love doesn't have a short temper. Real love doesn't walk on eggshells or make other people walk on eggshells. The longer I am married, the least offendable I become, okay? Like you gotta have thick skin if you wanna play this love game. Because you will have things said to you in real love that are the kindest, realest, most life-giving things that you will ever hear. You will also have the most hurtful, painful, challenging things said to you that you could ever imagine. And that's okay. That's okay. But you better have them some thick skin if you're going to make it through. Real love keeps no record of wrongs. I want for you to tell you tonight that if you're keeping score, you're not going to be married very long. Like if you are the kind of person who's always bringing up the past, you ain't got a very long future. You ever met this person? Every time that things get hysterical, they get historical. <laughs> it gets all like crazy and wild. And they're like, well, you remember that time you said that your mama cooked better than me? You remember that time that I asked you if I look good in this dress and you said, sort of? You bring up the past, and if you are so fixated on the past, then you are going to give up your future. Don't mortgage your future for the sake of the past. Love keeps no record of wrongs. You see, this idea is an accounting term. 
and it's the idea that I'm not accounting, I'm not keeping score, I'm not reminding myself of every wrong thing that every person has done and seeing who wins in the end. All that makes is losers. Love keeps no record of wrongs. First Corinthians chapter 13, verse six says this, love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. This part's really important in the modern day that we're living in. Love is never happy about sin. Love never delights in sin. Love never gets its jollies off of sin. Love never acts like sin is just a little game to be played. Love never sweeps sin under the rug and acts like it's no big deal. Love does not delight in evil, but it rejoices in the truth. It wants truth in the innermost part of its being. It wants purity and wholeness and beauty. And the problem with that is that that's what real love is, but what fake modern love is, is making love. What fake love is, is all about sex. You see, what used to be at the end of love or at the end of a relationship, sex now happens at the beginning of a relationship. And it's like, I swipe and I swipe and I swipe and I swipe until I match with somebody and then I have sex with that person. And then after that, I decide if I wanna build a relationship with them. You see, somehow what used to be the end has now become the beginning and it's made love that much worse. You see, outside of God's covenant design for marriage, sex has no place. And we've confused love and sex and turn sex and love not into an ideology, but a soteriology. We've acted like we could be saved through sex and love, like sex and love are going to complete us or satisfy us. And so what we need is just another sexual revolution where we become more sexually promiscuous and exploratory and you know, try multiple partners and you know, what if we're not sexually compatible and we act like that is what's going to fulfill our soul. And the Bible's going, no, 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 no. Real love does not delight in evil, but it rejoices with the truth. You see, true love listens to the Song of Solomon and says, do not awaken love until it so desires, until it is ready. There is a time and a place for that, yes, to be a part of love, but it is not the fulfillment of love. It is not the substance of love, and it's certainly not the starting place of love. I want for you to know today that at some point, if you want real love, you're gonna want more out of a relationship than foreplay. You're gonna want more out of a relationship than just erotic, passionate sex. You're gonna want more out of that. There was a study done that studied couples who have sex a lot and couples who don't have sex a lot. And um, it was said that the couples who have sex the absolute most amount of time, okay, in your wildest dreams, the most sex that you could have, the amount of time that they're spending having sex out of all the time that they spend, are you ready for this? Is 0.62%. That's it, 0.62%. That is the people who are having the most sex out of all the time. What they're doing is they're having sex 0.62% of the time. That means that real love is 99.3 something else. 99.3%, something else, not having sex is what actual real love is. Do you you know what real love looks like in my life? Real love looks like, you know, taking kids to school, picking up groceries and doing the dishes and figuring out who's going to do what and whose parents' house are we going to go to. And even if you're having the greatest sex ever, most of your time is going to be caught up in that. And so Don't just find a really great sexual partner. Find a companion for the spiritual journey. Find somebody who you can actually build a life with because it's gonna be about so much more than that. And I'm not saying that it's not important. Listen, it's really important, okay? But it's not most important. And we cannot allow culture to take what is meant to be God's wedding gift to us and sell it out as something cheap and counterfeit It's not going to actually live up to the beautiful design that God made it for. You don't want sex. You want godly intimacy. You want truth in the innermost part of your being. You wanna be able to show up here and not feel guilty and shameful and dirty every time you step into God's presence because he knows what you've been up to and you know what you've been up to. You want real love, committed love. Real love waits for what fake love demands right now. 
Fellas, real love waits for what fake love demands right now. First Corinthians chapter 13, verse seven. Love always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Real love always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. So real love is gonna change over time. Like I just wanna blow up this lie that, oh, if someone really loves me, then they could never expect me to change for them. No, you're gonna change, okay? Like if you're gonna do life with someone, you're gonna change, they're gonna change, it's gonna be a process of change. But there are certain things that should never change if it's real love, and it's that real love always protects. Now, I know when we hear protects, we think, oh, like he's got the muscles and he gonna protect me, right? Like that's the image, and that's a part of it, okay? Like I know I might not look very big, but I'm a puma and I will hurt you, all right? Like you come for somebody in my family and it's about to go down, all right? Um, and I will do that. That is the role that I will play for real love for my wife. But real love protecting goes far beyond that. Real love is about protecting their heart. It's about protecting their potential. It's about protecting the call that God has placed on their life. Real love is about protecting them from settling for something that they want right now in this moment and really stewarding them and leading them to what they want most. Real love is protecting them from toxic people who, toxic friendships that would get in there and lead them down a path that you don't want them to go. Real love protects them from that. Real love protects them from their parents. Their parents who maybe have too much influence and they've brainwashed or shaped their life or led them in a direction that's not right or good and holy. Real love protects them from that. Real love is always seeking to protect. Real love always trusts and always trusts Love without trust is impossible. Like if you could understand the power of honesty in relationship, okay? It would change everything for you. I don't know why we play so many games. Y'all need to quit playing games with your heart, okay? When you're not honest, you're playing games with your heart. You're messing with your emotions. You're digging yourself a hole. Like all of these games that we play, like, oh, should I text her? Like it's been 37 hours and 42 minutes. Is, it, is that long enough? Like, is it okay to text her back now? And like, oh, I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna play off. Like, I don't really like him, but then I'm gonna act like I like him. And then I'm gonna text him on this random night. And then I'm gonna like look at him from across the hall and like give him the eyes. But then I'm, I'm, I'm not gonna answer the phone when he calls. All the games, okay? All the games or the, the mind games or the holding things over their head or the you do whatever you want. <sighs> Babe, can I go play golf tonight? If you think that's best, I just want for you to know, fellas, it's never best, okay? If she's like, you do whatever you think, I think I will stay home tonight. I think, I think that's what I wanna do. But do you know the power? Do you know the freedom that you could experience if you would just be honest? Do you know what melts down relationships, unmet expectations and uncommunicated expectations? If we could just go, this is what I want and this is what I need and this is what I think and this is, what I, and this is what I, how I feel. When you lose trust, you lose everything in a relationship. Now, that's not, that's not to say that because somebody did something stupid in their past that they cannot build trust back. Some of you have put people in prisons because of something that they did when they were a little child and you don't see the person that they've grown into and that they've become. And that's not real love either because that's, that's love without grace and that's not real love at all. But real love must have trust, this trust where we can be honest and open. Real love always, always trusts. Real love always hopes and always hopes. Hope is a constant expectation that God is working even when I can't see it or feel it. Love is a constant expectation that God is working even when I can't see it or feel it. And so this is, this is what real love does is when there's a mistake and when someone blows it or when someone's in a rough spot or when they get in a rut, I don't believe that they're gonna stay there forever. I hope that they're going to grow. In, I've got this confident expectation that they are in process and that God is working something out in their character. That who they are today isn't who they're going to be tomorrow. That they may have fallen down, but that the Lord's mercies are new every single morning and that he is not done with them yet. Like that their best days are ahead of them. That's what real love does. It is imagines this future for who this person is becoming and says, I'm committed to this process with you. Love is never pessimistic. Love is always optimistic. It's always imagining the future. Now, it doesn't mean that you just bury your head in the sand. Like love needs community and perspective and honesty. We just talked about that. It needs honesty. But you've got to have hope. You, you can't throw in the towel and 
Stop believing that this thing's going to work out. Love has to have hope. And then finally, love always, always perseveres. Love always perseveres. Perseveres is a military term, and it has to do with being positioned in the middle of a battle. And what it understands is that true love, and don't miss this tonight, okay? True love is an act of the will accompanied by emotion that leads to action on behalf of its object. I'm going to say that one more time. Real love is an act of the will accompanied by emotion that leads to action on behalf of its object object. Real love always perseveres and understands that when emotions leave, that doesn't mean that love left. That just because the feeling isn't there doesn't mean that love has been lost. Because I'm going to persevere. I'm going to keep on going. I'm committed to the process with this person. I'm not giving up on this person. We are in war and we are in conflict, but I'm staying in the trenches and I'm holding on. I'm holding on. It's an act of the will. Real love does what fake love can never do. Real love holds their hand as they walk to chemo treatment. Real love shows up to the doctor's appointment. Real love is still standing when they don't fit in their wedding dress anymore and when they don't look the way that they looked when you got married. Real love is there when their hair is falling out. Real love is there when they're in the bathroom puking their guts out. Real love is there. You see, fake love bails in those times. Fake love walks away in those moments. Real love holds on, perseveres. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, 8. Real love never ends. Real love never ends. You don't get that with Cupid. You get that with an act of the will with a choice, realizing that love is a choice. It's something that you choose every single day. You don't wake up in the morning and hope that you're love, in love with somebody. You wake up in the morning and you choose to love that person. You choose to die to yourself and place them above you. So Kayla and I have an incredible story and we are very much in love and our story could be turned into a rom-com. We met in high school. I saw her, time stood still, slid up in her MySpace DMs. It was amazing. <laughs> One night at a football game, I was playing quarterback and led the team to the state playoffs. And I saw her up there in the stands with another guy. And she ran up to me in the rain and was like, no, it was always you. <laughs> and from that point moving forward, we were together. That's a real story, y'all, okay, a real story. And so we've got all of this like romance and attraction. Like when I saw her, I could tell you, I knew my heart was beating out of my chest. And, and then as I got to know her, I was so enthralled because we were the, just the classic opposites attract. So different. I'm loud and obnoxious. She's well-behaved and well-mannered. <laughs> she comes from a wealthy family. I didn't grow up with much. We come from different families of origin and background, the way that we see the world and process emotions. And it's just different entirely. And so in the beginning, it was so attractive and so different and mysterious. But, but nobody told us that saying that the old preacher says that opposites initially attract and then they attack. And I'm here to tell you that in more ways than you could ever imagine that happened in our relationship. In the early years of marriage, we had to work out how different we were and how different we saw the world and how different our personalities were. And I had a lot of arrogance and pride and a, a, a lot of shame from my past. And I carried that in and conflict and dysfunction. And so... And so we had to figure out how all that was going to work together. And I just want for you to know that without Jesus at the center of our marriage, without us being committed to being Jesus people and knowing his gospel and following in his ways, I don't know that we would have made it. I don't know how anybody makes it without him anymore. The best thing that Kayla and I do for our relationship, the best thing for love in our marriage is not understanding love or some great tactic or principle or habit. It is giving our lives wholly and completely to the one who is love in the first place. It's the fact that I'm in love with Jesus and that she's in love with Jesus and that she's more in love with Jesus than she's in love with me that keeps us in love with each other. 
It's the fact that her obsession and my obsession and my devotion and my life is surrendered to his will and to his way and not to my heart or to my feelings. I've tried to walk you through tonight some really practical, some really beautiful, some really great things that you can do if you want real love, but you're never going to experience real love until you know the one who is love. You're never going to have a love that lasts. You're never going to have a love that holds on. You're never going to have a love that makes it through the dark night of the soul without the one who is love in your corner. What I say at every marriage that I officiate, I did it with Thomas and Lauren. I did it with Kate and Bailey. I said, Thomas, if you want to love Lauren best, then you've got to love her less and you've got to love Jesus more. I said, Bailey, if you want to love Caden best, you're going to have to love Caden less and you're going to have to love Jesus more. And Joe and Leslie got married at like 11, so I didn't do it with them, right? But, <laughs> but if I had, I would have said, Joe, listen, bro, if you want to love Leslie best, you're going to have to love her less and love Jesus more because your love for him, that love relationship is the only thing that is going to cause love to last. I want for you to know 1 Corinthians chapter 13, it's impossible without him. You're not gonna find that person without him. You're never gonna be that person without him. It is his love in you that gives you the ability to pour love out to other people. The strongest, most powerful working element in our marriage is Jesus' love. It's his love. So, a few thoughts in closing. The first is you may have felt like you've fallen out of love tonight. You're married and it's on the rocks and consider throwing in the towel. You don't know if it's gonna work. And here's the first question that I'd ask you. Is how's your love for Jesus? Because the vertical always affects the horizontal. How's your love for him? Real love, true love points you to the truest love. You see, the thing that I love most about Kayla is that in this relationship, I see Jesus' love for me like I see it nowhere else. In her faults, I see his grace. In her patience, I see his patience. In her beauty, I see his glory. In her personality, I see his creativity. In her growth, I see his sanctification. In, his mother, in her mothering, I see his fathering. In her heart, I see his heart. And in her intimacy, I get a glimpse into heaven. Don't settle for fake love. If this isn't the kind of love that you are looking for, I'm telling you, you need to be. Fake love will leave you empty and hurting and dry. But God's love, real love, that is based on actions, that is not based upon emotions, will sustain and fill your heart. First John 4.10 says it like this, this is love. Not that we have loved God, but that he has loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Until you understand that you are loved right here, right now, not because of anything that you have done or said, but because of who Jesus is, that he loves you in your mess, that he loves you at your worst, that he loves you in your sin and in your rebellion and in your running from him. Until you know that love, you will never be able to experience or to give real love. And so I wanna invite you to surrender to that love tonight with every head bowed and every eye closed. I want for you to know that everything that we've talked about tonight from 1 Corinthians chapter 13 doesn't just describe love, but it describes God. God is patient and he is kind. He does not envy or boast. He does not keep a record of wrongs. He is not rude or self-seeking. He is not easily angered. He always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres and God never fails. And he's brought you here right now at this moment in your life so that you can know his love because he is, is the love that you were created for. And so if you wanna give your heart to Jesus tonight, which is way better than giving it to another human being, then I just invite you to pray this prayer with me with every head bowed and every eye closed. Jesus, I need your love. I'm tired of living life lonely and on my own. I'm tired of drowning in my insecurities and my sin. 
And tonight I surrender to your love. I wanna crown you king. I wanna give you my life. I believe you died for me. I believe you rose for me. I give my life to you tonight. In Jesus' name. If you prayed that prayer, then we just wanna mark that moment with you. It's the most significant decision you'll ever make in your life. And so on the count of three, would you raise your hand up in the air if you prayed that prayer tonight? One, two, three. Amen. Come on, amen. Amen. Let's celebrate people falling in love with King Jesus tonight.